Hello, Evgeny. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. After the Chernobyl catastrophe, you were in charge of containing nuclear emissions from the exploded reactor. To understand what situation the Japanese workers are finding themselves in right now, can you explain to us what was it like to work in Chernobyl? It was a great deal of work to be done. We only had seconds or minutes to do the job if we wanted to avoid a long-term impact on human health. Can you imagine what the conditions were like? According to statistics and the UN report, more than 650,000 rescuers took part in dealing with the consequences of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident. That gives you an idea about the scale of that effort in which practically all Soviet ministers and agencies were involved. Five years had passed since that accident. We were commemorating that anniversary and we were drawing conclusions. The IAEA senior expert came to visit us from France. When he learned about what we had done, and when he learned that had been one of those who survived the construction of containment over the damaged nuclear reactor, he said, Mr. Evgeny, no one in the world, be it Americans, the British, the French, the Germans, nor the Japanese, could have done separately or together what you, the Soviet people, managed to do in such a short period of time. Let's not compare the two epochs and the attendant political circumstances. In Sweden, people came to work. They also have a nuclear plant over there, and as they entered the premises, radiation counters showed that they were polluted. An alarm was sounded, and an investigation began. The plant itself, the only possible source of trouble, was okay. If so, they looked at the Windrose diagram, and it pointed to Kiev. The Swedes raised a worldwide concern, and so the Soviet Soviet Union was forced to admit that the accident had happened. It would have recognized the fact anyway, but only later. We were building them in India, in Iran, and in China. Turkey is preparing to place an order too. The collapse of the USSR did affect the industry. Chernobyl caused a big outflow. We estimated the situation and saw that the reactor core fragments were scattered over a wide area add to that atmospheric transport, so we realized that there was every reason to cover whatever could be a source of further radioactive discharge. A shelter had to be built. It was another matter what kind of shelter, but covering it was a must. It was decided that after a sarcophagus was built, people would be able to come close to it, and that radiation measurements on its surface shouldn't exceed one wrong in an hour. That was unattainable, I regret to say, but the walls did show something near it. Where we failed was a roof. The work was on the verge of engineering risks. He had to have intuition and an immense amount of courage. The situation began to change, and that enabled helicopters to fly at a lower altitude for better observation. We developed specialized baby scalps inside which people were lowered. Every day we gained new knowledge, every day we introduced certain modifications, and as a result it became possible to do it within a brief period. What happened to those who worked at the Chernobyl power plant after the explosion? Do you know the stories of those people? How many survived? Today, I don't have the statistics how many of us are already dead. I think it's quite a lot. Invalids account for 60 or 70,000 out of those 650,000 rescuers whom I mentioned. In fact, the Chernobyl tragedy affected my whole family. Being a professional, I understood that there was no one to do the job except for the professionals. It's clear. Second, my wife dealt with nuclear energy, and she also visited the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. Regrettably, today she has cancer. After several serious operations, she's now, though it was hard for me to say, a person with very limited physical abilities. But she's not the only one. There are many people like that. I think we can draw comparisons between the Chernobyl accident and the current events in Japan. And we should understand that there is a great difference between the two disasters. Luckily, according to the information which I have, although it's so scarce that even for an expert, it's hard to assess what's happening there. In the worst case scenario, how bad the situation could be in Japan? The only thing I can say is that no active zones or active fuel discharges into the atmosphere have taken place. Thank God. That's why the scale of disaster in Japan is different. Yes, it's true that the radiological situation around the station is periodically getting worse, and radiation levels are increasing dependent on the events there. 
I mean minor explosions, so to speak, that discharge radioactive gases. But the most important thing is that there are no discharges of nuclear fuel, which contains the entire Mendeleev's periodic table of chemical elements. That is why the events that are still unfolding in Japan will be less global than the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident. It exceeded 90 times the yield of the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. First, I don't think the discharges are going to be as massive as at Chernobyl. Second, the atomic energy industry will suffer certain losses because the reactors hit by explosions are going to be lost. Five, six, or even seven nuclear reactors out of 55 operating in Japan form a significant share, but they are unlikely to make the weather. But the most important thing that we have to bear in mind is that the current negative events in Japan are taking place at first-generation nuclear power stations that were built in 1971. They are 40 years old. By the way, the Chernobyl nuclear power plant was also built in the 1970s. As for the current state of atomic energy, I would like to talk about Russia first. The Russian atomic energy industry has undergone significant changes and modernization since the Chernobyl nuclear power plant accident. Additional changes have been introduced to projects specifically to the metal, as we call it. The safety standards at today's nuclear power stations are worlds apart from the safety levels of stations built in the 1970s or 1980s. Everybody predicts, fears, and sows panic that the powerful reactor of the type used at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant that are still in operation are not safe enough but safety standards at these reactors have also been upgraded. Therefore, they pose absolutely no threat today. After the Chernobyl accident, the world sort of stepped back from atomic energy. People felt negative about it. They were reluctant to work on it. Moreover, young people didn't want to learn the subject and develop it further. I guess the hardest consequence of the Chernobyl accident was this gap in the intergenerational continuity today's generation in charge of the world's atomic energy didn't take over those traditions or the experience of those who actually created atomic energy at that time. You engineered the sarcophagus. Could the Japanese do the same? In order to preserve human lives, there has to be an agency to supervise such dangerous industries. It should set regulations and requirements developed upon experience, knowledge, and traditions for these industries. Certainly, this agency should be created within the United Nations. Today, they say that the IAEA determines this policy. But unfortunately, the IAEA has no such rights, even though it certainly possesses large intellectual potential in this area. But it's just a recommending agency. It cannot prohibit someone from doing something today. Today, the Prime Minister of Japan is taking over the direction of operations at those stations. This is a wrong decision. He has a lot of other tsunami-related things to attend to, including villages, towns, and industries washed away by the waves, thousands of victims and so on. This is his main headache. Despite this, he's torn between the two, but he's no specialist in this area. What I mean is that we have a highly organized and, most importantly, international agency, which is giving authorization to act. The radiation level was so high that people couldn't spend more than a minute near the Chernobyl reactor and had to wait for hours afterwards to continue their work. What are the first symptoms of radiation exposure on people? One person needs is knocked down with just a flip, while the next can be overpowered with a sledgehammer. It's highly individual. Let me give you an example. There was a post-war accident at the nuclear facility in Yugoslavia. Three scientists were exposed to radiation. Two died, but one of them survived. An investigation established that he had drunk some alcohol before it all happened. There are reports that radiation level is 20 or 30 the normal amount in Japan right now. People are scared, even in Russia's far east. What is the critical figure it should show to be worried? The figure that you need not fear are 20 m's an hour. 
It's absolutely safe, being the natural background. Mountain climbers get more exposure, for example. People flying on board an aircraft get between 20 and 100 times more exposure. But you are only airborne for just three or four hours. That's all. A lack of information breeds panic. There are two things that must not be allowed. Everyone should have truthful and accurate information. We must not be afraid of information. If in Japan there are no discharges outside of the buildings, if fuel or fragments of the reactor's core are not blown up into the atmosphere, there will be nothing to fear. Everything will be normal and quiet. How does one act? Firstly, don't come into the open if you can avoid it. Shut all the windows and doors and switch off your ventilation if you have any. Secondly, put on your individual protective gear. There are respirators. There's a specialized protective clothing that should be changed from time to time. Get a hold of a dosage meter and have it on you wherever you go to monitor the situation. Thank you very much for your time.